I truly believe within three to five years tops means it can happen sooner, but the more likely time span is somewhere between three and five years. The social, political, and, Amer and economical upheaval here in the U.S. will rival, if not surpass, what we saw during the Great Depression. And uh, again, I don't have any product or service benefits from that type of uh, advice given out to people, but a good part of that advice comes from the, the foundation of what I see happening from my through my spiritual eyes. And the, the, the troubles that I see different than why I say it'll be worse than the Great Depression is, at least in the Great Depression here in the U.S. anyway, there was a moral fiber that held people together and people were still much more helpful and willing to work with each other, even if they were on the other side of the political aisle. In today's complex economic landscape, where financial uncertainties and inflationary pressures are becoming increasingly apparent, the intersection of monetary principles and religious values takes center stage. Rafi Farber and Peter Grandich, seasoned figures in the financial industry, recently engaged in a thought-provoking discussion addressing the impact of economic systems on society and the role of faith in navigating these turbulent times. In this video, we delve into their insights, exploring the challenges posed by inflation and debt, the importance of moral principles in finance, and the potential role of spirituality in shaping a more sustainable future. Rafi Farber and Peter Grandich initiate their conversation by highlighting the inherent conflict between the monetary systems prevalent in today's world and the moral principles embedded in religious teachings. Farber emphasizes the deceptive nature of inflation, framing it as a form of legalized theft, where the government erodes the value of individuals' money while leaving behind only the illusion of wealth. Grandich echoes this sentiment, drawing parallels between the biblical mandate against stealing and the systemic theft facilitated by inflation. The discussion broadens to encompass the pervasive nature of inflation, extending beyond the realm of currency to impact various sectors, including education, communication, and medicine. Farber suggests that society is inundated with inflation, a metaphorical trash bin where kernels of truth are obscured by layers of deception. The question then arises, how can faith or a connection to a higher power serve as a guiding light amid such pervasive economic challenges? Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. We're an investment community or we're a monetary community and we want to put in uh, God to our message and it's kind of, it's hard to do it. But the way I see it is that honest money, the only economic law in the Bible that we follow religiously is don't steal and inflation the way that this monetary system works is it's a system of theft if, whether you realize it or not it's a it's an ingenious system of theft because what inflation basically is is the government stealing your money but leaving the receipts in your bank account and then using your money for other stuff or loaning it to somebody else and then you end up with all this debt but all the money has gone and then all the debt that you all the all the wealth that you think you have is actually nothing and it ends up in a giant tower of babel that collapses at some point and I feel that we're really near there. Um, so how do you how do you see the? Uh, it's hard to even phrase this question. How do you see uh, God or religion playing into this entire game here? Because I see it as very obvious. There's a big hole. Inflation is everywhere, not just in the money. Inflation is in education. Inflation is in every sector of society, in communication, in medicine. There's piles and piles of trash in every sector, and there are still kernels of truth that you can find, but you got to dig around, and it's a big trash bin. Uh, so inflation has poisoned us. Um, how, can, how can God get us out of this? Well, no matter what part of the book you read, you do bring up a good point that it is a book that for thousands of years uh, has been the basis for how people have tried to live their lives uh, especially regarding money. Uh, from the Christian standpoint, uh, there's more talk about matters of finance than there is about heaven or hell. And if you think about that, you would think that most people would realize, well, I think the end game is all that matters, right? Am I going to heaven or hell? But you're telling me there's more chatter about things regarding money. And I say, yes. And uh, I, I, you know, in, a, in an extremely secular industry, I don't know if there's more of a secular industry than the finance world. I mean, I was told literally when this first started back in 2000, 
Uh, I went to the big firm we were working. I was with their compliance department. I told them what we wanted to do. And the guy basically said, hey, you could put a rock on the door. You could put a bull or a bear, but you ain't putting God's picture on your door. And, uh, you know, leave that for Sundays, you know, was the kind of a line that I got and all. But uh, for me, at least in the last half of a 40-year career, it became the basis to work from a foundation. But it is difficult. But one of the things that both Judaism and Christianity shares many things in common, one of them is, is that there's a, a good guy and there's a bad guy. And the bad guy has basically been worked out of the picture. Most people don't talk about it. Most people don't imagine it. And if they do, he's just a little red guy with a little fork in his hand. <laughs> and uh, you and I, I think, because I've watched, read your work and all, we also know that there's little red guys working at the Federal Reserve and, and in various administrations around the world. And so there's good and bad in everything, and there's good and bad in financing. But there are some moral principles that I think those of us who do chant decide to stand on scripture. And, you know, you, you take your chances with that in that there's there's only three ways people are going to look at you. And I'm certain this has happened to you. You're either a charlatan, you know, you're just using this to benefit yourself. I don't care, just make me money kind of people. Or where you've been, I've been waiting to find someone like you that shares these commonalities and believe we need to put our faith uh, first. And uh, for that, uh, I found that uh, it, 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 I hope you would agree, even though I know where you're located, it's easier to sleep at night than it would be if I was doing the opposite of what those teachings were. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's in terms of do I think that I'm doing the right thing? Uh, I never really doubted that as soon as I came to this conclusion. So in that sense, I sleep well at night, though, you know, there's a war all around me and I don't quite support the government here and uh, people who, who know me know that I don't, um, though this is my this is my country, so I can't I can't leave. And this is my family, so I can't leave. But um, it's it's especially difficult being around a family that really you know pisses you off and is not behaving well. Uh, but what can you do? They're, they're your family. It's uh, that's that's the problem. Both Farber and Grandich acknowledge the unique position of their industry where the inclusion of religious principles is often met with skepticism or resistance. Grandich recounts a moment from his early career when he was advised against incorporating God into his financial endeavors. Despite these challenges, both speakers find solace in the moral foundation provided by their faith, emphasizing the dichotomy of being labeled a doomsday prophet while maintaining an underlying optimism for a positive end game. The conversation then turns to the intertwining of religion and finance, particularly within the context of Christianity. Grandich observes that discussions on financial matters surpass those of heaven or hell within religious teachings, indicating a profound connection between faith and monetary principles. He reflects on the moral principles shared by Judaism and Christianity, where the dichotomy of good versus bad extends beyond theological realms to influence financial decisions. Um, but yeah, what, what you said about, about encountering those three, three, three types of people, just make me money, or I'm a charlatan, or you know, where have you been all my life? Actually, it's mostly been the, the last one, where have you been? Uh, because if you're looking for a religious guy who is talking about money and finance, then there aren't many. So when no. they find you, they stick to you. It's, that's, that's nice. Um, but then it's, it's, it's like the, the, the duality of being a, a doomsday guy, but also fundamentally I'm an optimist. I, I, find that, I find a hard time explaining that to people. They don't understand. I'm talking about the end of the world all the time, but... but but I'm an optimist. Do you, do you share that also? Because fundamentally, I know this is going to be over. I know all the inflation is going to go away. I know we're going to go back to the truth at some point. I just don't know what kind of stuff we're going to go through in the meantime. But I do know that the end game is a good game. It's, it's, it's good. Um, just how we get there is going to be trouble. Uh, how, do you, <laughs> how do you see that happening when this all clears out? what is humanity going to look like? And do you think we're near that point? I mean, you've been through a lot more than I have. Is, is something different about the world now? Because to me, it seems completely insane. Um, I, you were around in the 80s and 90s, you know, you were in, in finance. I was just a, a baby and a kid. Uh, is there something fundamentally different about these times than, than those decades? For me, yes. I've, uh, I'm just about to celebrate 40 years in and around the financial arena. And I began the year with a podcast that said, 
I truly believe within three to five years tops means it can happen sooner, but the more likely time span is somewhere between three and five years. The social, political, and, Amer and economical upheaval here in the U.S. will rival, if not surpass, what we saw during the Great Depression. And uh, again, I don't have any product or service benefits from that type of uh, advice given out to people, but a good part of that advice comes from the, the foundation of what I see happening from my through my spiritual eyes. And the, the, the troubles that I see different than why I say it'll be worse than the Great Depression is, at least in the Great Depression here in the U.S. anyway, there was a moral fiber that held people together and people were still much more helpful and willing to work with each other, even if they were on the other side of the political aisle. Now here in the U.S., there's basically five things that I think set us up for this issue. Faber highlights the moral challenge within the financial industry, where individuals embracing religious values often face three distinct perceptions, being seen as charlatans motivated solely by financial gain or as like-minded individuals seeking to prioritize faith over monetary pursuits. Despite these challenges, both speakers agree that aligning financial decisions with moral principles offers a sense of peace and tranquility, providing a foundation for ethical conduct. As the conversation progresses, Grandage brings attention to the looming challenges facing the United States' insurmountable debt, a retirement crisis, an immigration influx, the impact of BRIC nations, and a deepening political paralysis. Drawing from his extensive experience in finance, he predicts a social, political, and economic upheaval in the coming years, potentially surpassing the difficulties faced during the Great Depression. Faber expresses concern over the diminishing moral fiber within society, emphasizing the need for a cohesive moral foundation to weather the impending storm. Uh, the first and the biggest, and I know you talk about it, you know, a lot, the, the, the insanity of the debt binge, which has now gone beyond an old movie, which we used to be called Failsafe. There is no turning this around and getting away with an easy way or a mild way of fixing the issue of the amount of debt that's been acquired both on a government level, corporate level, and a consumer level. That's the first. The second is a retirement crisis. Why that's critical is two thirds of Americans are working paycheck to paycheck and they're never gonna reach that nirvana that the commercials from the financial institutions show them uh, what they have to look forward to. They too will also come a, uh, a burden, so to speak, in that they'd be looking for government assistance to get through much tougher years at much older ages. The third, which is quickly moving up the rival number one for the U.S., and that's an immigration invasion that is happening here in the U.S. And what people have to stand in, I'm not here to talk about, well, there may be some bad people in here, terrorists. I'm talking that the lion's share are just very poor people that were whisked away and happily by the countries that they left, so not to burden them, coming to a place that offers, even from what they're getting now, far superior than what they were getting where they were. Who wouldn't want to walk a couple of thousand miles for that? And who isn't going to tell a bunch of friends back where they are, you should come too. But most of those, if all those people are coming just with the shirts on their back, so they're also going to be falling upon uh, the needs of economics and social support uh, here in the U.S. The fourth is the BRICS. I don't think Americans and clearly the financial service community gives it uh, anything close to the respect and the necessity to understand of what's evolving there and how that's basically being set up for countries to eliminate dealing with the United States. Not lessen, but basically not deal with them. And I don't think Americans realize the ramifications. And then the fifth, that you would hope that could fix any and all of these problems, the political paralysis we have now. We have two parties. Uh, not only can they not even get in the same room with each other now, but there's members in each party who can no longer work with other members in the same party. And so one would expect that if any and all the issues I spoke of and others that I haven't come to be acute, you would hope there was a political will that could somehow fix it, and I don't believe it exists in the United States.